meeting of the regional school committee to order. Um, and before approving minutes, I want to officially welcome our two new members. Um, we have Heather Lord from Amherst. Welcome. Um, I neglected to welcome you last week, which was actually your first, first um, your attendance at the Amherst School Committee meeting was your first um, meeting, but um, welcome to the region. And um, also to our new representative from the Leverett uh, School Committee, um, Bethany Seeger. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I think before we call to order the other two committees, we have um, uh, approval of our minutes from April 7th as our first order um, for the region. And um, Sasha emailed that to all of us this uh, earlier today. I don't know if folks have had a chance to review that. And thank you, Mike, for um, projecting it. Mm -hmm. Did anybody have um, corrections, comments? Mr. Harrington? I just had the name thing again. Um, in the third section under new and continuing business, it has me as H.A. Harrington twice back to back. Yeah. And I then, actually, oh, I'm sorry, Ben. My oh, bad. sorry. That, no, that, I can't that, see you, so my bad. Yeah. The uh, the last sentence as well, right there. With, uh, motion carried, five zero one. Yeah, right there. That's all I had. So uh, I just want to jump in because I'm going back and forth. It should say the regional school committee, not the Amherst school committee, at the top, I believe. Oh, yep. That's all I had. Any other comments or edits from the committee? Mr. Demling? I move to approve the minutes of April 7th, 2020. Moved by Demling. A second. Oh, seconded by Lord. Thank you. Thanks for stepping up to make a motion. Um, are there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, we'll take roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Oh. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. I think you're still muted, Mark. Dancer, okay. why? I was having trouble getting the icon to show up. Sorry. Yep. Thank. And Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, abstain. And um, Mr. Benino is not present, so that carries uh, seven zero one. And um, I should make notes to myself, but um, I believe because we're uh, on a, a virtual meeting, we need to take a uh, roll call attendance. So um, we'll start with uh, McDonald presence, present, uh, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Answer present. And Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan present. And Mr. Menino absent. Thank you. Sorry. You need to include me as well. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Seeger. <laughs> Seeger present. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. There's so many faces on the screen that I'm trying to keep track of who's region and who's not. Thank you. And I apologize. Um, okay. Since uh, moving on, um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the um, Amherst School Committee, I now call the meeting of this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.35 p.m. Um, and we'll take roll call for that. Um, McDonald present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. And Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Sarah Hall. Thank you. 
Okay. Sarah says she's having microphone problems. How do I do this? And so I'm just thinking if it continues, the vice chair of Pelham Wait, what is currently, this? currently, uh, I need to be reminded of that. I believe it used to be Mr. Menino, and I don't know if it still is. Oh, no, uh, Miss Jess, did you become the vice chair? Um, I was short for a short amount of time, but I'm not anymore. I believe it went back to Ron. Just Google me. Okay. I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it. Okay, the secretary then is Miss Stancer. So then it would it would defer to her to call the meeting to order if uh, Miss Hall um, is not able to resolve the technical challenges. Um, I call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee on Tuesday, April 28th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Stancer present. John Louis present. Um, who else do we have here? Oh, it looks like Sarah may have left the meeting and maybe is trying to call in. Right, because until she can acknowledge it, uh, I'm looking at Ms. McDonald a little bit. Um, for, yeah, and I, I uh, have an email. I'm distracted because I have an email from Mr. Menino saying he's trying to get in. Um, I don't know if that there is a call in, someone trying to call in right now, a 617 number, um, but I'm not sure who that is. That might be Sarah. Yeah, that was my guess. Let me see. The link that um, Mr. Dimling sent earlier um, is what I just forwarded to Mr. Menino. He said he's on video but can't see us. So that is not Ms. Hall, I don't believe, in terms of the call in, um, unless I have the numbers wrong. Hmm. Well, um, I don't know, Ms. McDonald, if you Should want, we... we could at least go on to public comment and see if by that point we could call the, the Pelham School Committee to order. Yeah, let's do that. So we'll move on to um, item number four. Um, and just as a reminder, we've, we've asked for, we we're uh, enabling public comment by email. Um, and members of the public may always reach the school committee at school committee at ARPS.org and share the comments. Um, and for public comments to our, our regularly scheduled meetings, and we ask that you email them to myself at mcdonaldsa at arps.org by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting. And I believe we have two public comments that we've received today. So we will share those on screen um, briefly so that uh, members watching um, may read them and um, on their own. Okay, would you like me to bring them up now? Yes, please. Okay, sure. All right, can folks see that? Does that feel like a sufficient amount of time, Ms. McDonald? It's to me, does, does anybody need more time to read the comments? Being uh, shaking heads, so I think we're good. Thank you very much. Okay. And those have been sent to um, CLO for the record, 
um, so they can be integrated into the minutes of the meeting. I believe um, is uh, Miss Hall on the phone now? No. And I haven't heard back from Mr. Menino to understand if he's been able to get on yet. He said he could see us, but I'm um, sorry, just to revisit that. Yeah, his his email says I'm on video, but can't find anyone. So I'm wondering if he's using a different link. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to. Oh, there um, he is. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Perfect. Welcome. Perfect timing. Time, Mr. Menino. So uh, would the Pelham committee like to call to order? Sarah, so just got a... go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry. Sarah just got on a link to me, the one we emailed. He says, are there only the two of us in the meeting? So she's having trouble getting through too. Okay. Um, so we now have one, two, three. Do we need four or three enough? Three is enough. Okay. So now seeing the presence of a quorum, um, I call to order the Pelham School Committee on Tuesday, April 28th at 6.42 p.m. Stancer present. Jean-Louis present. Nino present. Great, thank you. Okay. So now three committees have been called to order, so we'll move on to our new, in, uh, our superintendent's update. And um, as noted, there's um, two specific updates. Uh, the first one, Ms. Cunningham, who's on the call, will give, which is about the middle school and the Pelham principal search update. And I'll give a very brief update on COVID since there was a longer one that everyone had access by email to um, uh, on Thursday, either in video or in person. But I'll turn it to Ms. Cunningham, who's gonna share an update on the principal searches. Hello, everyone, good evening. With uh, Pelham, we have community forums that will take place on Thursday and Friday of this week from 11.30 to 3.30. There are four individuals that have been moved forward. We sent out a request for questions from the community and from the staff and families from Pelham. And we did receive some questions from about six or seven families that they would like to see asked uh, during the during the forum. Um, the same for ARMS, an email will be going out tonight or tomorrow morning to let all the uh, middle school families know that the forums will take place next week, Wednesday and Thursday from 11.30 to 3.30 also. This time with that search, there are three candidates, one with, there, there started off being four, but one withdrew. And so there are now three candidates who are moved forward to meet the community next week. And so um, if anyone had any questions about the process, uh, timeline kind of stuff as it's coming up pretty soon, uh, before I transition to COVID, just wanted to give the opportunity for anyone to jump in. Um, thank you, Ms. Cunningham. I want to publicly thank Ms. Cunningham uh, leading these searches in the midst of uh, both uh, school being closed, a virtual environment, um, as well as um, just challenging circumstances in general. It was no easy feat. I noticed uh, you may have seen that some other districts have sort of paused their searches uh, for a long period of time, and I just am very proud and appreciative of the work of Doreen and the HR department and everyone who volunteered to be on the interview committees and screening committees that we're not wildly off schedule and that we'll be, we're, we're gonna be in a good place to find excellent principals for both Pelham and the middle school uh, with sufficient time to onboard them because onboarding is gonna look a little different this year than it typically would, uh, critically important, but doing it virtually at least um, to start is gonna be, have its own challenge. And I also uh, just wanna appreciate uh, people who are already making lists and, and thinking of how, to, how the principals can connect with families uh, students in the community once they're, that person is hired and, um, you know, really uh, try to be connected in this 
kind of awkward environment that we currently find ourselves in. So, you know, thank you, Doreen. Thanks for all your team's work. And thanks for all the volunteers who found ways to juggle, uh, many of them, their own kids, distance learning for their kids, their own jobs to, to be on those committees was no easy feat. And thank you for shepherding through that, Doreen. So uh, transitioning to COVID, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I did a rather lengthy update at the Amherst School Committee meeting, although there was nothing I said there that wouldn't apply to any of the other districts on Thursday night. I sent the video link with the timestamp of when that started. Um, so I'm not gonna repeat all of that. I'll do sort of just updates. Um, so uh, one update is we, on Friday, uh, we had a live streamed event where we had three counselors, one elementary, one middle school, one high school counselor talking about how to support your child's uh, well-being and emotional health. I found it to be outstanding. I was like the easy job. I was just a facilitator and I was uh, frankly in awe of the work of the counselors. Um, we got excellent feedback. We had 130 some odd people on the uh, live stream and, and I think there were over, uh, I think it's over a thousand views now um, So because I know a number of people couldn't make it. But if you can't watch it, I mean, just with my educator hat off, just uh, really appreciated the feedback and advice that my parent had on that, that the counselors were able to offer. So thank you to them. And we're actually trying to think if we can do this on a regular series. There were so many questions, so much parent interest that we wondered, you know, is this something we could do, you know, every other week or something, you know, for the duration of this uh, period because people have new questions emerge. Um, that's the reality of being a parent anyway, and particularly in this environment, they seem like they're, uh, at least I find them emerging uh, at a faster rate than they typically do. Um, we continue our hotspots and Chromebook, uh, you know, process, you know, every time we think, okay, we've got everyone, someone else emails or calls or contacts us for someone. So we have another um, pick up later this week for the numbers aren't that many, but it matters to those individual families that, you know, they're getting internet and they're getting Chromebooks. We still feel like the numbers are very, very low, but um, we're happy people are continuing to reach out and, you know, thank you to the IS staff for continuing to work on that. Uh, last week, we passed uh, 20,000 meals um, support supplied for families uh, in our district which is just an amazing number. And actually Friday is school lunch hero day. Um, so we're gonna do something to celebrate our folks who are making those incredible number of meals for our community. Um, we are uh, getting started with summer and fall planning, trying to figure out what summer programs will look like. Um, we typically run um, at the high school credit recovery, but also special ed K to 12 programs, um, as well as ELL, ESL or ELL and Title I programs. So. We are sort of uh, bifurcating our, uh, our approaches because, you know, one, you know, frankly, uh, outcome that looks more likely is a primarily online environment for summer. We're still not making that decision, but we're planning around both of those. Our fall planning is a larger process. We expect to receive guidance from the state in the near future. We are reaching out to actually uh, healthcare professionals in our area to get feedback from them. Uh, and I think there'll be some teams formed on a variety of topics and in, in the near future, probably within two weeks. Uh, one about the educational piece, and we know that there's, there's a difference between distance learning and typical school-based learning, some on a mental health approach, some on an operational approach, um, which involves, includes health and safety, uh, some on a governance approach, and I'll be looking for some members uh, from the committee to join on that because there's going to be a different set decision tree on a lot of uh, a lot of decisions, frankly, we've never had to consider before. Districts have not had to consider before. Um, so more soon on that, we're probably, I think I said on the other night, we're at a three, six, nine week uh, kind of thought process. And that's probably two weeks away to really getting deep into fall planning. We would like to see some guidance from the state before we dive in, but we won't wait much longer than that because I don't think we can. Um, there were new DESE guidance. Uh, and there was new DESE guidance that got shared uh, over the weekend uh, around distance learning. The good news for us is that about 95% of it aligns with what we're doing. Uh, interestingly, the part that is new has been something that both families and staff have been asking about, uh, asking for, which is, uh, can we start teaching new content? You know, the guidance at K-8 to had been, um, no, that we're only uh, kind of teaching prior content and going deeper. And at this point, the state is, is uh, opening that door for us to go through. And I think for many of our staff, we were hearing you know, there's only so many times I can go deeper into the same previously taught content, right? That works for a while, and at some point, uh, it was it was getting more challenging to keep, to have engaging uh, activities and instruction for students. So we're meeting with staff on that tomorrow to go over those, and for the majority of the rest of it, um, really aligns well to our plans. Um, 
and uh, so people will see a difference. And I'll be communicating out on Friday some of that. Uh, one of the the big things that was interesting was uh, really discourage use of what's called synchronous learning. So like what we're doing now would be a synchronous call um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, we're doing some synchronous learning, but much more focus for them was synchronous learning for special populations, ELL special ed. Uh, and synchronous learning around check-ins and synchronous learning for office hours, like, you know, if there's an assignment that students can go in, but whole class synchronous learning is not the recommended approach that DESE is having. And, and we're doing some of it, and, and um, but uh, they're finding districts that are going um, more full bore on that are, are having a really hard time. And if you do watch the mental health um, or emotional well-being video, you'll see a number of families uh, suggest that their students are anxious to go on calls, will not do it, and I'm hearing that across the spectrum. That's not, you might think that might be a, a younger student thing, and we're finding that students um, are struggling a bit with, ace with synchronous uh, connections and um, even class meetings, really K to 12. Um, so we're going to be adjusting things a bit. We're not, I think we're well aligned on that front. We're not relying on uh, that all day long, and there's also a concern about screen time in students and and how what that does. And so uh, more soon on that. But I was really pleased, and and you, you've heard me be critical of Desi. You might hear me be critical of Desi a little later in this meeting. I thought they really had an excellent document. I shared it with some colleagues in other states, and they were uh, frankly quite jealous that the guidance was thoughtful, uh, measured, and appropriate for the current situation. Last update is we do have uh, kind of the outline of a plan for high school graduation. Uh, thank you, Amherst Media. They're streaming this, and uh, thank you for all your work, and they're going to help us out. Uh, the short story um, is that what the students and families, the majority of them wanted, was some walking across the stage physically. And so what we're doing is getting advice on how we can do that in a physically distanced manner. It'll probably be quite literally an all-day affair, like eight or nine hours, because of the number of students we can have at any given time is going to be so low. And what Amherst Media has agreed to work with us on is to get the video spliced, you know, we'll have recorded speeches by the chair of the school committee, the superintendent, the principal, the valedictorians, all the typical speeches. Um, and Amherst Media will shoot those eight or nine hours of, of footage of students walking across. It's not at Mullen Center, it'll be outside a stage, uh, splicing it together to look like it was more typical, like it's not going to be a nine hour video, right? It'll probably be like an hour and a half or two hours, like our typical graduation. So the memory of it will be there, but students have that experience of walking across the stage and having a diploma that was really critical. The student council uh, met with Dr. Gramacki, our assistant principal, and Mr. Jones, the principal, uh, and that was the, one of the, the real asks uh, and things students expressed real passion about was not having a truly virtual graduation even if it's sort of artificially physical, right? It's not, a, uh, it's not at the Mullen Center and it's not gonna be the typical one with people watching in the same way. Uh, but to have, um, have used video technology to have that memory, but the physical walking across the stage was, was critically important to students and we're gonna respond to that and make it work for folks. Um, so a uh, lot of logistics, as you could imagine, that we're working on, but one of the great things is having Amherst Media to, to be able to support us and, of how to do that video very quickly. We have a tentative date. I don't want to say it yet because once I say a tentative date, it won't feel tentative to people. Um, but the other thing that we're working on is having high, uh, the high school seniors end their classes a week earlier than they typically would have. Just an acknowledgement that their senior year has been really hard. It allows for a little more uh, preparation for the online graduate or the physical slash video graduation as well. Uh, it would end with the last day of AP exams. So, um, you know, that, that does it. It also gives enough time for students who may be scrambling to get their credits done to be able to graduate to have time to be able to do that. Um, and we didn't want to have them stay longer than everybody else because they're trying to do that. That didn't feel equitable to us. So we found a happy medium and there was a positive response for students that they will uh, be able to end um, a, a full week earlier than they were typically planning to end. Because if you don't know, in Massachusetts high schools, which is still foreign to me, even though I've lived here my whole adult life, uh, high, high school seniors seem to grad, they, they finish classes like a month before everybody else. In the state I grew up in, that was not the case. So we baked in a 98 degree day in late June uh, for our high school graduation. And that's uh, fortunately for Massachusetts high school students, that's not the case here. But uh, we responded to their kind of what they expressed as desires, uh, what was most important to them. And, you know, I think we have a really good plan. There's still details to be worked out, but a really good plan to allow for that um, and I think the video splicing idea will, will make it seem, you know, a little more natural than if we were doing something like this, a graduation that looks like this. 
And that's my COVID update for tonight. So happy to take any questions if there are any. Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, so thanks for that update. You answered all my questions. Um, the, the graduation uh, plan sounds really great. I think um, having a, a public community event that's positive and celebratory will be really nice for the community. Um, so look forward to that. Um, if, uh, if you could give a brief status update, like brief on, uh, we had talked about um, a survey being done to parents about um, how distance learning was going so far. And, and, and if I recall, it was only uh, for parents. So I didn't know if we had plans to, to do a similar, even informal uh, outreach to, to students on their experience as well at the, at the regional level. Yeah. So uh, that parent survey, as well as the staff survey, went out on Friday. Um, we had, did not have explicit plans, I think, about students. I think at the regional level, it's a really good point that that uh, would be useful feedback. Not that it wouldn't be at elementary, but it's a little harder. They don't know all the email addresses. And you know, there's some logistical challenges, as well as developmental challenges of, of what that'll look like. So let me bring that back to the team. That's a good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any um, more. One last shot. No, I think that's that's everything. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. So now we're um, going to move on to new and continuing business. Um, and our first item is our uh, discussion on the superintendent evaluation. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, would you like to introduce this topic? Sure. So um, like ages ago now, we started with kind of a rough outline of the superintendent's evaluation. And um, it's Obviously, with everything going on, we need to consider how we're going to update both the timeline and I think with some guidance from the uh, MASC we've received, the folks are also looking at updating kind of the, the structure and the content um, that we're used to for the evaluation. So um, just to refresh everybody's mind, um, back in the fall, we set goals for the superintendent and each of the committees represented here today have their own set of goals um, and the typical way we do this is we set the goals and then in, in the spring the superintendent presents um, artifacts and um, we complete you know we have a, a meeting where we go over everything and um, we're typically only supposed to give feedback on the specific goals that were set and voted on by the committee so um, the whole there are a couple concerns. One is just that um, the year has changed radically in a way that nobody could have predicted. I think some of the goals we set um, will still align with the things that we care about. The other thing that's radically changed is just the amount of bandwidth for everybody on the team, including the superintendent, in terms of um, you know, the presentation of the artifacts is usually a multi-page document that I believe takes um, Dr. Morris, you know, considerable amount of time to put together. So um, Alice and I have started a conversation about what would the timeline look like? Um, and then we've also started talking about whether or not, um, or what should the presentation of the artifacts look like this year? And, and also, you know, how are we going to recognize that um, the, the goals we set out, uh, obviously need to be, um, I don't know the best way to phrase this, but it's it, just that the goals that we set out, we had limited information and we didn't know what was you know ahead. And so they may not be necessarily perfectly aligned with what's um, what have been the priorities of the superintendent since the pandemics. So um, I'll, do we have the dates in the agenda or should I, I don't know if it's worth trying to share my screen. I, I, I think so, um, Alice and, and Carrie. I'm sorry. If you want uh, what was sent to the school committee, I can share that pretty easily. If that if that's the document yeah, that you're looking to nice. share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I think this is it. Just is this the one you were hoping to share? Yeah. Well, that'll 
That'll work. So we were thinking today is April 28th. And so we're having an opening conversation about the discussion of the instrument and goals in light of the current crisis. Um, May 12th, we're hoping to kind of finalize and improve an instrument to gather feedback from the committee members um, at the regional pool committee level. And this only reflects the region and Pelham. So um, obviously it's great to have Pelham folks on now because we can see if this works for, for the whole um, community. And then um, trying to, oh, I guess Amherst is called to order so we can discuss Amherst students too, can we? Okay, great. So June 16th, we have the Amherst School Committee have a modified artifacts presentation June 18th. Um, hopefully the committee members would complete their evaluations by that point. Um, June 23rd, which would be soon after the schools are closed, we'd have a modified presentation of artifacts. Um, June 26th, the regional school committee members would hopefully complete the evaluation at that time. And then June 30th, the Emerson School Committee meeting um, to review and vote. And we could also, have, it would be a joint meeting again with the regional school committee on the same day meeting for a review and vote. So this is just a draft. So please, um, you know, we're, we're looking for feedback. And in terms of thinking about um, what it's gonna look like given, um, given everything that's been going on in the past few months. Yeah, before we uh, start this, I'll, I'll just add to that. One of the things, um, I think the two key things that we want to sort of um, talk about this evening and sort of come out with um, clarity on is the timing. Um, clearly, so um, for those of you paying attention, this um, we have added an extra meeting at the end of our normal calendar, this June 30th. So do we want to do that or do we want to move it up and try to finish because normally the 23rd would be our final meeting of the school year at least for the region and I think um, Amherst was right before that and I would imagine that Pelham is, is somewhere in there so timing is the key piece and then the other is um, the what do we want to have as modified artifacts as, as Ms. Spitzer um, described them um, uh, given given the current situation, um, and I think you know there's there's some conversation about whether it would be a PowerPoint uh, a PowerPoint presentation from uh, the superintendent as opposed to the typical lengthy report that is fabulous, um, but obviously requires a, a significant investment of attention and time um, to produce and prepare that, um, and likewise for the committees. Uh, significant amount of time to read, digest, and, and, and sort of reflect on that in writing the evaluation. So um, those are the, the two key things I, I think we're, we're hoping to, you know, come away from tonight with clarity on that. And Allison, if I could, just yes. the only thing I'll share is that we wanted to have this, even though it's a, a large meeting, both this and the next topic, seem like it, it made sense having the three committees uh, together because there, there typically is at least some overlap this year less than than others but um, so that you know in terms of an evaluation piece at least uh, if nothing else each committee knows what the other committee is thinking and what their timeline might be um, so that's that's one of the reasons we asked for a joint committee tonight sorry about that with yep. Nicole. Ms. Stancer. Um, so what would be the process if we wanted to alter the artifacts to reflect the things that have happened? How would we go about doing that? Great question. I'm not really. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm not sure it's a matter of altering the artifacts. Um, I, do you do you mean the goals perhaps maybe because I, I don't think we can go back and and um, create new goals but if if I remember you know for example one of our goals was wellness and I think that we could be looking at that wellness goal in light of the pandemic now some of the other goals may not as neatly align with what's been happening and I think that the big thing is that I don't think I think the thing we want to avoid 
is um, holding the superintendent up to goals that made a lot of sense in the fall, but given what's happened, maybe he didn't have the time or the resources to achieve the progress that we would have expected in a normal year. And so I think that the guidance is that we should be um, not necessarily setting the goals, but making sure that we're not, that, that we're recognizing and not holding the superintendent um, up to standards that are no longer appropriate. So, um, but I'll let others. Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, so uh, a, a few thoughts. Um, one, I, I don't think we should move the timeline up before June 30th. If if anything, my first glance at that schedule was that we should push it later. <laughs> uh, and just because, you know, as, as we all know, May is going to be all budget all the time in a really compressed, intense, we're cutting things time frame. Um, distance learning that we've, they've gotten recent uh, guidance on is, is really trying to ramp up as much as it possibly can. Um, so to have those two major things that aren't usually happening this time of year go on, um, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to, to push it up even further. Um, in, in terms of the general question of, well, how do we change what we're expecting? I mean, I think we do it by what we're doing right now, which is discuss it and <laughs> talk about um, you know, how we all want to approach it. Um, the, the, the way I, I frame it is that I think about the, the document, right, that we, that we fill in, that online survey um, that, that comes from, um, from DESE. And, and basically it boils down to a set of ratings and a set of, of narrative text inputs. Um, and, and going based on the last few years that I've been on the committee, and even years before that, um, members, even in a normal, normal year, have decided on their own whether or not they wanna fill in the boxes or whether they wanna fill in the narrative text or whether they don't wanna fill in either or whether they wanna fill in both. Um, so in terms of the minimal legal requirement, um, th th there isn't really much of one in terms of you have to fill in the text boxes, you have to fill in the rating boxes. So I think it's really up to us in terms of what's appropriate. Um, and if that's the case, then then I think the, the thing that, that we should be flexible with this year, given what an extraordinary exception year this is, is that I think we should probably be fairly liberal with our interpretation of, of what is in scope and out of scope in terms of whether it actually ties to a predefined goal. Um, it, would, it would seem really artificial to uh, talk about the superintendent's performance this year without mentioning COVID-19. I mean, it just, it just wouldn't jive. And, and I understand that you know, a performance is often above and beyond the defined goals, but um, I just think in this year that would be um, a, a little odd. Um, I think I think a way to um, to limit the um, uh, the time demand on the superintendent um, so that he doesn't feel the the need to produce um, a, a really meaty artifacts document is to define some sort of narrative input, but define it at a very limited length. Like even if the school committee said we're looking for three pages, no more, of of a narrative summary of. Um, of your review of your goals and your performance, uh, the rest of it, rest of the year. Um, that's really all I would be looking for. I think if we, just just my view, if, if if we try and quantify it down and say, you know, these goals can be rated, these goals can't be rated. We need artifacts on these goals, but we don't need art. I just think it's over engineering the process. I think I think simpler is better, and and the less that we um, spend time trying to engineer the process, the the, the better will be. Um, I guess the last couple of things I'll say is I, I do want to hear an update at some point about the goals that we've defined. Those were important goals that we worked on uh, for a while. And so I don't, I'm not looking, personally, I'm not looking for an artifacts document anytime soon, but I think as this process closes out, as part of the feedback from the superintendent, I, I would want to get an update on those. Um, and I also want to respect the right of any individual member to fill out as much of the instrument as they want. Um, you know, like I said, there've been years when not all members have approached it in the same way. So if somebody wants to fill in every single rating box and every single narrative, I think that's their right. Um, and, um, you know, it will be up to the chairs to, as it always is, to fold in the inputs from all the different members. Um, so those are the basic principles I've been thinking about.
Um, well, I'll, I'll just build on that. I do, um, I think, you know, it's not like, um, it, yes, the world has changed since um, March 13th, or probably even going back, you know, March 1st, but there was a lot of work that was done up until then. And so it's, it's not to say that just, you know, because the world's changed, we're ignoring the, the, work that had been done, the great progress that had been made on on, on many of those goals. Um, and sort of taking a page from the way that we're approaching student um, evaluations and teacher evaluations, I would I would approach the same as recognize, you know, something that an update that provides the committee with information on and, and a reminder and documentation of the work that had been done. Um, and in the, you know, and and as you say, Mr. Demling, not quite as, you know, we don't need the the 20 page um, fabulous document, but something that at least, you know, brings us all back and, and focuses us on, on, on the work that has been done and put into place. And in many cases, sets a foundation for continuing work on, on many of those goals. So it's not like it's one and done, um, but sort of where, where are we and, and sort of that forward looking. And so I would agree that some sort of update, um, whether it's um, you know a presentation at one of at at, at that um, meeting, I can't remember when we have it there. The the twenty third, you know, towards the end of June, accompanied also with with a narrative or instead of something that gives us an update and, and reminder of the work that had been done through March and sort of you know maybe a sort of forward looking and sort of what um, what's left to do or what um you know what how we're positioned for continuing that work and going forward uh, dr morris yeah so i just want to say uh from my end i do think uh some level of presentation would be, be beneficial for me and i think the district because i think in this particular unique it goes back to the same question we always have about how do you build goals for next year and how does the evaluation feed into goals and i do think it's such a bizarre year, as you all have noted, that I do, you know, even if it's a slide deck that's a bit longer, but that it, it engages and engenders two-way dialogue with the committee. I think that is something I would look forward to, both to share that update because you know we've done it regularly in different ways, but this would be a, a sort of a culmination. Um, but I think that dialogue would really be helpful in terms of thinking about goals that aren't only COVID-19 and safety and public health moving forward, as opposed to at least you know, just doing a written document without, you know, the last couple of years, it's been a lengthy written document and very short on presentation. Uh, I might think about my personal opinion, uh, flipping those, um, because I think that two-way dialogue would be really helpful because it, we haven't talked about those things in a couple of months. Um, mm -hmm. So not just in terms of the evaluation, and I get there's an evaluative part, but I think actually for, for a district direction to have some conversation, uh, we've not gotten back, as, as Mr. Demling noted, to really some of the topics that we were either talking about or planning to talk about. And um, so I do think if it's, if it's a presentation that engenders two-way dialogue between the committee and, and district staff, myself but particularly, but district staff, I think that would be really helpful for us um, in terms of moving forward. So that's just my two cents. So I wanna recognize that, um, that we also have the Pelham School Committee here. Um, and I don't know um, to what extent you, you have comments on this or um, thoughts on these. Uh, timing and context, or sorry, artifacts. <laughs> Hi. I'm fine with everything. Ms. Hall? Hi. Um, yeah, so I agree um, that it should be, as Peter said, some kind of expounding on the narrative form, if that's what makes sense. Um, and it just from Pelham's perspective, I think everything that you're saying makes sense. And I think minimizing the added work by doing something different is important. So I would wanna just be consistent with, with what you're doing. Great. Ms. Spitzer. I just wanna to respond to a piece that Peter put out about maybe pushing the dates back and just see do, how do people feel about maybe changing it to be a little bit later. I see a thumb up. I'm good with later. I figure none of us are going on summer vacations as we know. 
really, really available in July. So yeah. <laughs> Mr. Denling. Yeah, I, th I think the only thing on timing is in general, I would defer to the superintendent and the chairs to to maybe come back to us to to, to make a recommendation. Um, there's there's so many large parallel irons in the fire right now uh, with summer and the budget and the fall um, that uh, like Dr. Morris alluded to, it, it may be helpful to define some of these things earlier so that we can then plan um, how the future goal is going to impact the fall, but, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't have that visibility. So um, I'm, I'm definitely fine with it going later. Um, I would be hesitant to make it earlier uh, and I would, I would defer the level of adjustment to to you all. I do want, I, I brought this question up um, an, earlier. I, I also uh, agree on the timing. It, as you can see, it gives us very little time. This current timeline gives us even very little time to produce the instrument, right, from, the, from when artifacts are there. Um, but I do want to also, so when we go back and weigh the, and look at the dates um, for this, I also want to be conscious of if we have any statutory requirements of, of timing for getting this done as well. So it's uh, figuring and balancing all of those um, requirements will be important. So any more um, comments on the evaluation? I'm not seeing any. Okay, great, thank you everybody. Um, so we'll move on now to the next item on our joint agenda, which is FY20 bus contract and fees discussion. And um, I don't know if that's Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter. I'll queue up Dr. Slaughter for, okay. um, just to give some context. So, uh, and this is in the packet, but um, so when schools were closed, uh, DESE put out a document and they encouraged uh, districts to work with their transportation vendors so that essentially to work out some level of compromise in terms of spring payments to transportation companies. And the thinking was if, if no districts paid bus companies this spring, there would be no bus companies to transport students when we got back for summer or fall. They, um, they run on really tight margins and uh, there was a real fear that, um, yes, we would save some money, districts would save some money in the spring and then uh, not be able, literally not be able to get students to school in the fall. Um, so uh, there were some questions, legal questions that emerged about paying for services not rendered. I was on a conference call this afternoon with our state Senator Comerford, as well as um, Senator Lewis, um, who is the chair of the, or co-chair of the education committee. Um, there will be legislation in the Senate in, in short order, just to clarify that question, that, that it is, um, districts are able to uh, pay transportation vendors in a situation like this spring. Uh, it was a gray question. It wasn't clear either way uh, in prior law, and they're clarifying that. Um, so the vast majority of districts have been working together. DESE's advice was for uh, business managers who work with vendors to work together to come up with some common rates so that it wasn't every single district negotiating with every single vendor, because there are more districts than there are vendors. We are in an unusual situation uh, because of our transportation contract with Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury, where we have um, two different vendors. Uh, we actually have a special ed specific one about Vanpool, but I'm gonna leave that out of this conversation for tonight. It's much smaller than the others, which is uh, currently Cosmescus and Five Star. As you remember, next year, starting next year, it'll just be Five Star uh, based on the bids. Um, but, you know, so uh, I'll ask Dr. Slaughter just to share an update. Now, this is neg negotiations that are ongoing, so I just want to be really cautious that we can share some information, but uh, like any other negotiation, we're not going to perhaps be as be able to be as explicit as we might uh, when it's done. I will say that when it's done, it will be a decision that eventually comes to the committee uh, to be briefed on and to vote on because it is adjusting a current contract. Um, so we're not quite there yet. I think we're getting closer as Dr. Slaughter will share with you. Uh, but, you know, um, thank you, Dr. Slaughter, for being one of the very few, uh, if only, superintendents who's doing double duty on these um, 
of these negotiations. So I'll turn it over to you if you want to share a quick update. And again, with that caveat that that uh, we are sort of bound to not go into um, the level of detail that we will be able to probably next time we meet. Right. So you know, at at present, um, I've reached out to our attorneys uh, to uh, craft some language for us to amend our contract with each of our two vendors. Um, and so that's in process currently. I've suggested to counsel, you know, what uh, what sort of level of payment we'd be comfortable with, I think, and that I will recommend to you when we get to that to that place, which will be hopefully fairly soon. Um, it's it's interesting in sitting in two different groups of districts, uh, you know, the sort of demands on those districts and the uh, and the uh, constraints on those districts, and likewise on the vendors. Um, the vendors are in very very different places. One of our vendors is a much smaller vendor, uh, and by virtue of the group that they work with, uh, there's some carrying costs or some some fixed costs that they carry as a percentage of their whole that's it's a bit higher and a little, a little tougher circumstance that they're in at this time. And so um, they've been very willing to work with us. They're anxious to find out from us because they're all, uh, as, this, uh, as Dr. Moore said, you know, they run on a tight margin. They run on fairly close margin, uh, you know, cash flows. Um, um, and so they're, they're in, in uh, you know, difficult circumstances very quickly in that regard. Uh, the other thing I would point out is that for, for our two companies, uh, they have laid off their drivers primarily because that was preferred by their drivers. Um, they actually, by virtue of going on unemployment and the current additional $600 uh, federal stimulus bonus in that, in that unemployment contract generally works out better for those folks. That changes the calculus on, on what we want to uh, support relative to uh, helping keep them viable uh, as we go through the re remainder of this year and, and preparing for next year. Um, so we're still in negotiations, and uh, we've gotten good information. They've been very forthright with us on that. Uh, we're going to get some language from council that we'll then share with those those vendors and then try to move along pretty quickly at this point. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'll add to Dr. Slaughter that is not giving any negotiations away is that it, the number is less than 100%. In other words, there will be some savings that come with it. And for all three districts, that's really important because, you know, at the region, I'll speak specifically to that, that as you know, any funds that are left over going to E&D, which supports next year's budget. Um, and at Amherst and Pelham, you know, at all three districts, we've got had some additional costs that we've had to bear uh, given the current situation. And that will really help us get through the year in a way where we can land out um, in the way, in the place we do and, and where we want to be uh, fiscally at the end of the year. So um, kind of the number will be less than what we're, we're banked on. I think it will really help us with some other costs and potentially could help us even with the FY21 budget as well. Um, we'll. We'll find out a little more about that in a little bit, but I think Doug wants to jump in one more yeah. time. Just one other thing, since there are representatives from Leverett Chutesbury, their elementary schools are also part of that contract. Um, whatever savings there will be, we will also pass along in the same sort of manner to you folks. And so that'll help. It's it's not huge numbers, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the impact on the, those, but any little bit helps at this point in the year. And, and uh, so that will be coming, but it's, you know, we've got to figure out what that, we've got to get the negotiation finished, then sort of do the math on it and then pass along what that, what that means for all the districts, including uh, the, the elementary districts in Leverett and Shootsbury. Any questions for I have a comment. Yeah, Mr. Sullivan. Um, so the smaller bus company that you're speaking of, they did not give their drivers a choice. They received a text at noontime on Friday, March 13th, tell them to, they better sign up for unemployment beginning that afternoon. If I can. Um, so just to, you know, in, in sort of following up and, yeah, they did. They did that right away. Um, I, you know, I think that was even before there was any potential government programs uh, that might help support them in that regard. They could they could see the writing on the wall relative to what their costs were. Uh, I will say that they have, uh, you know, they currently, you know, under normal circumstances, pay eighty percent of the health insurance as as a as a piece of that. You know, sending that message out to folks, they they're covering one hundred percent of those people's. Uh, uh, health insurance at the present time. So they've, there's been a little give and take there. I think they've been, you know, probably in conversation with some of those, those drivers since that time, but I, you know, um, they, I think they knew immediately once they, you know, we're going to cancel school for several weeks that they, 
they were going to not be able to have cash flow to pay those people. So they made a decision really quickly, I think, to try to get those people in the queue as quickly as they could so they could get some support. And then um, it's, it's a tough circumstance. I don't envy those folks at all. Uh, really been hard. Any other comments or questions? So I'll just say the next step so that Dr. Slaughter working with legal counsel will, will hopefully finish those negotiations soon, perhaps even by the next meeting that may be optimistic, but I think it's it's in the realm of possibility um, that we may be able to do that or two weeks away, it'll come to the school committee. Um, I think the other next step um, just to be aware of is as that process is going on, you know, the fourth quarter budget's gonna be the most complicated fourth quarter budget that, that uh, yeah, and that's not true. That's true for every organization that we're not we're no different than anybody else in that regard. Uh, but we'll be able to hopefully itemize what those um, what the savings will be and how that will help both this year's budget and potentially next year. So that's that's sort of the work on our end. And uh, we'll keep you abreast of that and hopefully be able to bring it to you sooner as opposed to later uh, for the kind of adjustment and contract and a vote on that matter. And oh, uh, the, the other thing I was going to say is typically those votes uh, historically are taken by the regional school committee because they have representatives of all, all the towns. So it wouldn't necessarily be a joint uh, or uh, meeting school committee meeting needed. But we thought uh, rather than update everybody at their next meeting, it made sense to have everybody. And if anyone had any questions, for them to have the whole group together. So I'll just ask one more time if anybody has questions. I'm not seeing all of the uh, talking heads on the screen. So I just wanna make sure that everybody's had a chance to ask a question or make a comment if they want anyway. No. Okay. Seeing no other questions or comments on the um, FY20 bus fees, um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Hall for um, to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Okay, I will take a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Oh. Oh. Moved by Jesse. Second. Okay. Uh, well, we need to do a roll call, right, for everything? Okay. Hall, I. Uh, Ron? Menino, I. Jesse? Jean Louis, I. And Margaret? Stancer, I. All right. Thank you, everyone. Sorry about those technical difficulties early on. Thank you. Um, and now um, I will take a motion for the Amherst School Committee. Ms. Spitzer. I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. I second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. Roll call vote, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. McDonald, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. And now uh, moving on to our region only agenda, portion of our agenda. Um, our next topic is FY20 third quarter update. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. Yep. And so uh, I, this is should be on your screen. It was in the packet. Um, Dr. Slaughter is going to, as I mentioned, the fourth quarter is going to be the, the more interesting one. But uh, we'll go, I'll ask Dr. Slaughter just do a broad summary of the third quarter update and see if there are any questions people have. All right. So I'll just point out a few things here. Um, I think the, the, the sort of simple good news that we have is that it, if you look at the sort of bottom right corner of that <laughs> that uh, you know, the, the number of uh, $379,762, it looks like we're under budget by about that much. It's likely that that's kind of the right order of magnitude. Um, I think, you know, we're doing all right relative to our salaries. They're, they're very much sort of on track. Um, I think some people might expect our substitutes to be, um, you know, we won't have any more substitute charges through the rest of the year, but uh, at the same time, that does carry some of the people that were out on long terms. Uh, substitute situations where someone's out and someone else is covering for them. So uh, it sort of 
carries that that cost in the substitutes line, which is why it's nearly spent all the way uh, to zero there. Um, amongst our regular expenses, I think you know in in the positive area under special education, we had a couple less um, out of district placements this year. Uh, but yet we picked up one or so, and so that's still in, in a positive area. Um, the other one under other programs, you can see about three hundred thousand dollars. That is because um, the preliminary versus the more refined uh, you know, numbers around charter uh, costs and reimbursement uh, from the state uh, worked in our favor this year. Um, their prediction originally of what we thought we'd have for students that are charter students was, was much higher than the actual number of charter students. So that, that helped as well. Um, in the encumbered and projected columns, those numbers will probably change pretty significantly. We're going through now, working with our student services and other areas of our uh, of our uh, schools to look at things we where we might have uh, projected to spend money and then are not going to have those expenses. Um, you know, uh, transportation being an example of something similar to that. Um, there are similarly other kinds of, of services we get from from uh, from outside vendors relative to special education, um, and that sort of thing. It'll be a little bit less. Not all of them will go away, but some of them will. Um, and I think that. Um, you know, it's still a big unknown at this moment on, on some of those and how much they'll go down. Um, our utilities will be down a little bit. I'm trying to conservatively estimate that a little bit to, to understand what that number looks like. Um, and then, you know, the, the one area that's marked as yellow with a little bit of concern is under risk and benefits. And I think that, um, you know, our, our active employees insurance is a little higher than we had budgeted for. However, our retirees in both the Hampshire County group and the, and the teachers retiree group uh, are under under that, um, so that's helping sort of offset that that uh, that mismatch between what we budgeted and what our actual costs are. The other area that's a little larger this year, and this is just a, an, an artifact of of how this year has played out, is our unemployment insurance costs. Our unemployment costs this fiscal year have been higher than anticipated. Um, that's pre uh, going into this this circumstance we're in now. Um, and so there's just, you know, there were some claims uh, that, you know, weren't expected, uh, the usual things. The one thing to keep in mind when we do unemployment, it's, it's called insurance, but it really isn't. We're essentially, uh, it, it, we do cover the entirety of that cost. Um, so we ultimately sort of, it's, it, it's delayed, but, the, but nonetheless, we do bear the burden of that full cost. So, so we've had a little higher claims in that area than we anticipated for this year. So that's an area that hopefully as we finish out the year will not, will not grow much more than what it is projected to be at right now, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that relative to the other other things in our budget. So I think that captures most of what's going on. Again, I think we have some, some potential um, savings relative to our overall budget, which we'll try to leverage to help, uh, you know, sort of manage the rest of this year and also prepare ourselves for fiscal 21. There's gonna be some, some difficult uh, conversations over the next month relative to fiscal 21 and, and there are, some small things we can do and, and nuance of, of how we finish this year that will help us uh, as we move into fiscal 21, help hopefully uh, reduce some burden on fiscal 21. So we'll be looking at that as we move ahead. Mr. Demling. Um, uh, Mr. Slaughter, do you project that we may have more than 5% left over at the end of the fiscal year to put into E&D? That's an interesting question. I think it's um, it's a little hard to tell at the moment. There are some things that we can do um, in in how you use E and D between the end of one year and the start of the next that uh, they've hinted at as being uh, ways to prevent getting over five percent. I think you know I'm I'm concerned a little bit about timing. That's really my concern. It's not that we wouldn't uh, fairly quickly spin down if we were over that five percent threshold. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that we aren't. I think it's it's going to reveal itself in the next uh, you know week or so as we as we look at that a little more closely um, and get a sense of of where we can potentially utilize money this year to to keep us under that. But I wouldn't be surprised to go right at five percent because we'll try to to uh, you know utilize money in the current year and also then also preserve as much for next year for our budget as well. Dr. Morris. 
Yeah, just briefly, one of the questions on our conference call with regional districts, Desi yesterday was, were they gonna uh, relax the 5% threshold? Because uh, a number of districts are in the same boat as us. And we'll talk about this in, in a couple of minutes, we talk about the budget, but we have a multi-year budget problem. It's not an FY20, we have an immediate FY21 budget problem, but we've got an FY22 budget problem as well. And so there was some request from regional districts, you know, because there are, there may be some savings that other districts are facing, and and we were got a very clear no as to uh, perhaps changing that cap. So one of the things next week or two, when things shake out and we get the transportation piece, is also looking ahead about what purchasing can we do um, this year um, to reduce the burden on next year, and and perhaps reduce some of the reductions that we might might need to make. Um, so uh, it is something that you, you've spotted accurately as a concern, um, and it's something that we are concerned. And I think it'll make it sort of I don't want to bleed into the next agenda topic, but it but it, it tends to a little bit uh, as we start talking about FY twenty one as well. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I will, I'll stop because I, I think I fear I'm going to bleed it a little too far. So I'll stop there. Okay. Mr. Menina, did you have a comment or question? No. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I'm seeing none. Okay. Last chance. Good. Okay. Thank you. So now we can bleed into the next agenda item, which is, um, the FY21 budget discussion. Sure. So uh, because we have members who uh, weren't with us in the winter and early spring, I want to just go backwards before we go forward. So I, I apologize to folks if this feels like um, the reliving history, but I think it's actually worth it for everybody to go back a little bit. So we had a couple of four town meetings. Um, and after the last four town meeting, we came up with a scenario that seemed to work for all four member towns. We had um, at least verbal support from elected officials in all four member towns. And this body passed the budget uh, in early March uh, and uh, life changed, right? And so the fiscal situation changed along with it. Uh, we received updated guidance from the town of Amherst. We'll get formal guidance, uh, I think, the day before our next meeting. I think the 11th, we'll get formal guidance from Amherst. What I shared at the Amherst School Committee on Tuesday night was the best case scenario Amherst is talking about is a level-funded budget. A level-funded budget means a 0% increase. Um, what's particularly unique, oh, I should also say that Amherst has asked all departments, uh, including the Regional School Committee, to revote a budget by June 1st. Uh, for the Amherst Town Charter, there's an earlier date, I think it's April 15th, if I'm not incorrect, but it's in that vicinity. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but it, it's around there. And, and so they've extended that to June 1st. And uh, I know for some of the other three towns, they are still at least on the docket for having town meetings in June. Uh, I will share my personal thought that, um, you know, at least one Leverett has indicated, um, last I checked, have not set a date for the town meeting. Uh, one of the things that we're hearing, uh, we heard on a conference call is that many towns, while they have a town meeting date set, uh, there's really an open question from a public health perspective if those meetings are going to occur um, as scheduled or they'll need other, you know, some towns are talking about virtual town meetings. I'm not sure quite what that looks like, and then I'm not going to weigh in on, on the likelihood of that. But I think it's fair to say this open question whether all towns will be able to meet in their traditional way before the end of the fiscal year. Um, I, that I feel comfortable saying that that's a question. Um, so we are actively looking at both the operating budget as well as the capital budget um, and seeing what we need to do at a 0% increase, not for Amherst, I want to be really clear, but at a level funded budget for the region, that would require a cut of in the neighborhood of $500,000, just shy of, I think it's 494 or something like that. Um, that was uh, the, the delta between the FY20 budget and the FY21 that we were planning, that, that got voted by this body. Um, we are also looking at the capital budget. Uh, we've received uh, information from multiple towns to uh, that if it's not about health and human safety, uh, uh, imminent health and human safety, uh, um, that things shouldn't be on the capital budget um, this year that are not about that. And frankly, some of that's because of the uncertainty of the, the state budget, the federal budget. Um, you know, it's a really challenging time, not just because the numbers are bad, but because the uncertainty is incredibly high. 
one of the really interesting things in our conference call, uh, and by interesting, I don't mean that that has a positive connotation. I'm not sure that my statement will, uh, but was a real caution about setting assessment methods because typically what happens, uh, for those who are new to the regional um, district, is the governor sets, the governor comes out with a budget in late January, and in that budget, it sets the minimum contributions to the member towns. And everything flows from there in terms of whatever portion is gonna be attributed to the statutory method. And uh, I think that the challenge we heard about, so, so you know, the House and the Senate weigh in and the budget may change from what the governor proposed, but basically those core numbers of the minimum contributions and the relationship between the towns is pretty set at the time the budget passes, the, the budget is, the governor's budget comes out. We heard some really explicit uh, direction that not to bank on those numbers this year. That not just that the overall number change, but the minimum contributions and the relationship between the towns could change. And there's no timeline for that, which put every regional district on the phone saying, okay, what do we do, right? If we can't base anything on statutory numbers that are, that may be constant. Um, so if you do look, it's in the packet, they, they put out a multi-page memo. Um, and one of the things they, said, uh, which was sh really surprising, I think, to everyone. Um, and I'm going to just share the screen to that specific point. Um, but it was it was it was probably the the moment on the call that was the most um, shocking to folks. Um, so here's the, the part I'm saying is under additional considerations, I'll read out loud. We understand that regional school districts build their budgets based on the governor's budget recommendation. We expect the house budget when proposed and passed could differ from the governor's budget. As a result, items like minimum local contributions and state aid may differ. Um, it goes on from there and the next paragraph says, we also understand many cities and towns are accustomed to voting on their assessments rather than or in addition to voting on their school committee budget. The department recommends that each member explicitly vote on the total school committee budget rather than vote on the rather than vote to appropriate its assessment share this will provide a flexibility to members and the regional school committee to avoid the need to resubmit and revote the assessments if and when the local contributions and or state aid do change um, so that would be i mean just frankly a polar change in the way regional districts have done business i think it's going to be really daunting for towns to be able to vote on an overall budget for school committee with no assessment information uh, and some of that, which isn't as explicit in the letter, was that there's an assumption that no regional district will have a past budget, uh, excuse me, no regional school committee will have its budget passed by all member towns before July 1st. Because the state, there's real questions whether we'll have enough information to even appropriate assessments before July 1st. Um, so this is a complicated scenario. There's a number of ways you could take it. I think when we come back in two weeks, Dr. Schlott and I will have a little more in the way of recommendations, uh, how to manage this. Um, but um, it, this is unprecedented, you know, and I know that term gets thrown around a lot, rightfully so for our current situation, but as it relates to not being clear on what actual minimum aid is and what the relationship between towns, that's really hard. We haven't had situations where it's really a question whether town meetings can functionally meet. There was a question on our conference call, can, Select boards and finance committees vote in lieu of town meetings. We got a very direct no to that um, uh, for, for towns that have town meetings. Um, so the Amherst Town Council is meeting and, and can function. The other three are reliant on uh, town meetings, again, which may or may not happen as scheduled or even as hypothetically scheduled in terms of Leverett. I mean, I don't know, Ms. Seeger, if there's been a date, not to my knowledge in Leverett. Um, I don't know if you have an answer to that one. Ms. Seeger? Not to my knowledge. Okay. The last thing, 30 Thank days after, haven't set a date. Right. So we're, we're in a little bit of a, 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 com, a interesting moment. And, you know, I think for next time at that point, Dr. Slaughter and I will have a recommendation for you all to consider both in terms of uh, a budget given the scenario, but also perhaps a way to think about assessments. Cause I do think it's not going to fly in our communities to pass a budget with no assessment information, even if Desi's saying that that's probably the best interest. Uh, I don't see that as being, maybe I'll be proven wrong, um, but I think that's going to be problematic for some of our member towns. And uh, Dr. Slaughter, I've done more talking than I should have, but Dr. Slaughter? I, just to, to build on that point a little bit, I think that the, I think this is a piece that it's difficult for the folks at Desi to 
fully comprehend, but if you've said in town meeting or, you know, that sort of thing, you know, to leave that assessment number ill-defined by virtue of a budget uh, is, is essentially, you know, allowing a blank check, not entirely, but you'd have to essentially budget for a range of values. And that's something that none of our communities can do with, you know, if it's a couple hundred dollars, that's probably something they could do, but it's not going to be a couple hundred dollars. It's going to be a, a relatively significant number that would change. And I think that's going to make it really difficult for, for us to not have ourselves fairly uh, well-defined when we get into to those more detailed budget conversations. So as much as the, you know, the state offered that, that advice to sort of both the budget and the owner to come back, we're going to be, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for us to do that. I mean, I just think practically speaking, I even this isn't a political statement about you know, town meetings and what they want or don't want. I think just the, the you know, the comfort level any, any community you would have voting a budget, you know, voting this budget and then, and then, you know, sort of accepting the, uh, the results of the assessment method. They'd also vote the assessment method, but that would be uh, a difficult circumstance. So, uh, you know, we're happy to take any questions or feedback. We are thinking of some creative ways that we might be able to move forward. And, and I think, you know, um, all this happened yesterday with a lot of this new information. And, uh, you know, I think when we get to the 12th, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a place to both make a recommendation on those as well as the potential cuts that will um, for you are all consideration um, because everything's, you know, what, what usually is about an eight month process is like a five to six week process. Um, and, you know, that brings with it, it challenges um, as well. But uh, we'll stop talking and see if the committee has any feedback or input. Mr. Demling? Yeah, um, so I, I guess so two comments. One, one just really briefly. Um, as you are talking with other superintendents and other finance directors, please keep us in the loop about what you think ought to happen and what is the most reasonable plan going forward. Because, you know, uh, school committees are trying to do the same thing, right? And we're not all that well organized. Right? We are an informal collection of associates across the state, regional school districts. Um, and typically, we're advocating for regional transportation reimbursement and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, we always go on this assumption that that DESE doesn't really get what goes on in the dynamics of budget building for regional school districts. But I am just profoundly shocked that someone who is a state level educational administrator would would write what's in this guidance from DESE. I mean, this isn't that they understood it and then they they think, um, you know, this is a particularly recommended path. It just shows such a lack of awareness and understanding of, of how the just the base mechanism of the approval happens. Um, so um, I've, I've already heard um, a, a bit of um, consternation from regional school district members and leaders about what, what this ought to be more looking like. Um, and I think if uh, school committees and finance directors and superintendents are aligned as much as possible, that's our best shot for getting some kind of legislative pressure for a more, a more reasonable process because I completely agree with, with what you've both implied, you know, asking for a blank check and our towns essentially to fly blind and trust that we'll work it out later is, is not a budget process. It's just, it's, it's not. Um, and, and we need, we need to be able to go back to our towns and say that we advocated for you as a town, as well as our school district. And this process doesn't allow us to do that. So I, I, I hope this, the state can figure something better out. Ms. Seeger. I just want to make sure I'm following this correctly, but basically they're saying that the numbers for state aid could change and may change sort of out from under us and, you know, presumably um, in a journal that doesn't benefit us. Um, but that's what we would be voting on, like everyone's saying. We vote on some number that we kind of have an idea of what state aid is, but the state aid could change. I have one more question, but is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, and, and so the, the, there's two parts that are problematic. One is, I think everyone's bracing for a state aid shift, right? Um, the, actually the, I don't know how to say this. The second problem is that it could be that the relations between the towns uh, and how we formulate uh, the assessments would also change. So in other words, they wouldn't change uniformly. It could okay. be that some towns are worse off by X percent and other towns worse off by Y percent and therefore, when you put all that into the formula of who pays what for this overall budget, 
it could change. And that's why they do have language. I think the most helpful part of the language is like, even if it was a zero, a level funded budget, it might be that different towns pay different amounts because things are going to change even in a relational context. And the relational context is what makes the conversation next to impossible right now to have with the towns. And that's why Dr. Slaughter and I are trying to come up with some creative solutions that perhaps don't rely as exclusively on numbers that we're not going to know probably until the summer. Okay. It's, Do you have it's a follow-up question? Uh, mostly just, yeah, thank you. I'm mostly just thinking that it's unfortunate this that this, especially state aid, could be a pressure release valve for helping fix the overall budget. It's unfortunate for towns like ours who are already struggling to then have to think about that changing as well and, and struggling a little bit more. Thank you. Ms. Spitzberg, did you have a question? I guess it's more of a comment and I'm not, um, I'd, I'd echo everything Mr. Demling said in terms of I'm happy to advocate in any way I can in order to express our concern over, over this guidance. I guess the other thing that is just makes it incredibly frustrating is that all of this uncertainty is coming at a time when we're talking about what the fall is going to look like and not to go too far ahead, but the social distancing, the only way, if, if that's a reality in the fall, that's just going to require a lot more resources. And so being told that we're going to, you know, have uncertain but downward resources at a time when we're probably going to need so much more additional resources, it, if there's any way we can get, um, the little pieces we can control and, and, and put pressure on the state, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to do what I can in that way and let us know. Thank you. Dr. Morris. I'll let Dr. Slaughter jump in and then I'll, I'll follow up on his comments. Okay, Dr. Slaughter. So I think the, the simplest thing, and this comes from my experience sitting on select board and being in town meeting in Amherst for a number of years. So this is, is from that point of view is that when, when we've had these circumstances in the past, the state, one of the most helpful things as far as creating a budget is to get a resolution from the House and Senate on local aid. So the sooner that they can get a, a picture of what they think local aid is going to look like, that helps set the frame a lot because it, it, it dictates what the communities can expect in the state for aid. Um, it sets the picture about what Chapter 70 aid looks like. And so that helps really frame the conversation in a pretty significant way for everybody. It doesn't solve the problem, but it does helpfully, it, it does really set a frame that's really useful for getting uh, legitimate and concrete conversations started. Yeah, and so the three things I want to say, one is in terms of advocacy, um, my personal opinion is that right now there's a big debate going on, you may have read about it at the federal level, about whether there's an interest to support uh, states and municipalities budget gaps. Um, there have been some senators, Congress folks, um, to have indicated that that's a top priority for them, including some Western Mass um, delegates. Um, there's other people, and I'm trying to be very vague because I'm trying not to make a political statement, who have made some uh, very strong statements about uh, states maybe just, just go bankrupt um, because states and municipalities can't go into the, you know, the, the federal government's able not to balance its budget, right? We have lots of evidence of that, but states and, and localities can't. And so, I do think, you know, there, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be advocacy at the state level, but I do think that there's really an opportunity, like now, for for people to get involved in pushing uh, how critical it is for the federal government, um, which has spent, you know, multiple trillions of dollars on this already, to support states. Uh, right now, the state's looking at a, you know, at different estimates between four and five billion dollar deficit, um, and you know, the whole rainy day fund is less than that, and they can't spend it all at once. So. I'm not absolving the state from supporting public education, but I do think there, there's perhaps advocacy at all levels that might be might be warranted and beneficial. The second thing I want to say to Ms. Spitzer's point is she's absolutely correct. So we're, um, you know, one of the things that's, you know, perhaps challenging about thinking about budget cuts is there's a lot of unknowns in next year's budget uh, about what school will look like. That's really different than any other year. Um, you know, things like attacking class size or maybe our class size is low and we could create right? Some of those things just don't make any sense to be able to think about. So the, the number of things that are sort of off the table to make budget reductions in is much higher than it typically is. Um, and I think the third thing that 
Um, and I don't want to be in a uh, make this a competitive statement, and I'm concerned about that, but the qualification probably doesn't help at all anyway, is that we are in, for municipal government function, we're in a very competitive environment. In other words, if we be, if, if districts become um, such that they're not competitive with um, quote unquote competitors, um, it's not just that people stop coming, it's actually that we get taxed for that in terms of charter school bills and otherwise. So I do think you know it's critical that we think about all those things and it is a little bit of a perfect storm trying to do that with an unknown of next year and a budget gap. Uh, and that's what we're you know working on uh, day and night. You know, I mean, we have good people working in the distance learning uh, who I think are doing a great job, and we really many of us have had to shift where budget is kind of the primary responsibility, and we're we're, we're taking that very seriously. The distance learning is definitely going. We're responding to emails. Teachers doing a great job. Principals, curriculum folks, um, but trying to figure out how to cut half a million dollars without touching some of those areas is a real challenge, and that's what we'll come back to on May 12th with 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 our best. Uh, attempt at that and you know we are going to have to do things that we haven't done before for instance looking at school choice reserves and uh, we typically don't like spending and don't spend more than we bring in you know that rule is probably not going to hold this year if we're going to try to keep true to all the things you mentioned uh, Ms. Spitzer um, so we're trying to right size uh, how we're approaching that what dollar amount to use and we'll we'll bring that to you all next time and get some feedback from you and and try to get that budget done before June 1st. Sarah's long-winded answer. Let's try not to do that tonight. Does anybody have any further comment or, or question? Does, um, is there, I heard a couple people, a um, couple members talking about advocacy um, and, and being interested in, in supporting that. And Dr. Morris talked about advocacy, not just at the state level, but also potentially at the federal level. And I just want to pose a question, do we want to sort of coordinate um, on, on that a little bit going, going forward? I saw one that had Mr. Demling. Yeah, I mean, so there's a number of different ways to coordinate, um, depending on what the issue is and what level. Um, we've we've had some decent success with our colleagues across the state, who are other regional school districts, um, advocating at the state level. Um, I think when you get to the federal level, I mean, the other thing too is that I mean, we're one school committee, right? I mean, we are publicly elected officials; we should do everything we can, but you know, there's a limit to our influence. <laughs> um, so I think when we look beyond the state level, for sure, um, I would uh, personally be deferring to our state, our state representatives and then our federal representatives, right? And so I, I'd like my first thought is that we would, we should be reaching out to uh, Senator Comerford, Representative Lay, Representative Dome, um, about what they're seeing uh, as the most effective um, avenues for action. Because this is the whole, you know, the whole really hard to, um, identify trick about advocacy, you know, that is never really fully answered is, you, you know when to advocate, and you know what you need to advocate for. And Dr. Morris just articulated that. But what specific practical action can, can those of us who don't hold national political power <laughs> do in order to affect the change? And that's, that's really the $64,000 question. Um, and uh, so if, if we don't have an obvious answer to that, I, I would, you know, defer to that. So I think it's really just a matter of having, uh, you know, a, a a few of us sort of pound the pavement a little bit with our colleagues and with our state representatives about you know what's what's going on right now in terms of advocacy and where can we um, make a difference. Um, first to identify what our committee can do and then to reach out to other school committees to uh, encourage them to do the same. I think that's when we've been the most effective in the past is when we've identified an action that we can then sort of um, share with, with neighbors uh, in our region or across the state about here's something specific you can do uh, and then letting that percolate out a little bit. I don't think, again, not a very specific solution, but that's sort of the general approach uh, that's worked uh, sometimes for us in the last few years. Okay. Any other um, comments or thoughts? Seeing none. Gonna look again. Not seeing any. Okay, great. 
um, I think we can uh, move on. So thank you, um, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris for that. Um, our next item on our agenda is the removal um, deletion of policy CI, which I'm, I need to pull it up to remind myself the title of that. This is about the oh, filling administrative vacancies. Um, uh, and this was brought to sort of brought up um, by a community member um, in looking at this and as, as it, the policy itself is um, both online and is also in our packet for tonight. Um, this was drafted and approved um, in 93, so before um, ed reform um, and some of the, and, and, and most everything in this policy is no longer in under the purview of, of school committee. Um, and so it's an obsolete policy. Um, but the fact is, is it's still actually sitting there on our books. Um, and so we wanted to have this conversation about um, actually to remove it from our policy handbook. I don't know if... Um, if I've, I've stated that or presented that accurately, Dr. Morris, so I, and if there's anything anybody else wants to add on this or questions. I think the only thing I'd say is that uh, our attorney did review it and confirmed Ms. McDonald's statement about not being compliant with current um, the ed reform language around the role of school committees and, and district staff and all. That's all. And given that um, state law overrides policy any day, um, it, you know it's 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 sitting there. But I think from a it, it contributes to confusion um, and misunderstanding within our community about what role we do at the school committee play in the hiring of um, positions, filling of any positions outside of the superintendent. Um, so I do think it's important to go through the formality of actually deleting it. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Stancer. Uh, would it be appropriate for me to make a motion that we remove this policy from our books? That would be appropriate, and thank you for volunteering. <laughs> would you like to restate your motion? Um, I move that we remove policy, okay, what are the? CI. CI from the official policies for Amherst Regional Second. Moved by Stancer, seconded by Harrington. And um, we'll take a, uh, is there any further discussion or questions? No, no? So we'll take a roll call vote. I will try to do this in alphabetical order. Um, uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. McDonald, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Um, and that is, uh, oh, Ms. Spitzer, sorry. <laughs> I went around the circle. Spitzer, aye. Thank you. Um, thanks for waving uh, to my attention there. Um, uh, so that passes unanimously, 9-0. And I'll let, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Sasha, Ms. Frugaro to um, remove that from the yeah. website. I can do, I can take care of that. Okay, thank you. And now moving on to our next, which is a topic, which is planning for future meetings. Um, we, we talked at the, at our last meeting about this topic, about how we wanted to our meeting schedule as well as what topics we had on the agenda and how we sort of merge other topics into here given as Mr. I think earlier in the meeting, Mr. Deming described it, May is gonna be all, all budget all the time. Um, so I, I, I forwarded this document to the committee this afternoon. I don't know if everybody had a chance to see it before this meeting. So thank you, Dr. Morris for displaying it. Um, so I started with uh, what we have today. Um, I believe all of these meetings are currently on our agenda with the exception of June 30. 
So that would be the extra meeting. And then, and per follow, per our earlier conversation, we'll we'll take a look at um, if that's our final meeting of the year or not. Um, so just laid out uh, topics, uh, some of the topics. Uh, we do, um, I believe, Ms. Spitzer's probably been signing warrants um, uh, for the for the district. So um, since we didn't have that on the agenda tonight, we'll look at to having that at our next meeting, um, as well as looking at the instrument for the superintendent, superintendent evaluation. Um, I'm also proposing that we reorganize um, at that meeting because I'm still an acting chair um, uh, right now. Um, and then looking at it, May 20, so we'd be talking about a budget, um, a budget presentation and hearing at our May 12th meeting. And further discussion, potential further discussion on the 26th with, um, uh, and this was uh, all drafted based on sort of not knowing what our guidance was in terms of when we needed to finalize and vote on our actual budget. So as you can see, it just, it has that continuing until the June 9th meeting. Yeah, I did get, the only thing I'll say is I did get clarity that uh, since there was a hearing prior, we don't have to have it. I agree with Ms. McDonald that having a hearing where people can submit questions and we actively have the option of responding to them as opposed to public comment makes sense, but it's not under the same auspices as a you know, or same requirements as a hearing. I got clarity on that this afternoon. Um, okay. But I I think we should still do it. I think it's still, my personal opinion is this is a big change, it's a big community. I mean, we should we should be receiving public comments and being able to respond to questions and, and opinions that people, that folks have. So um, I just don't think we'll get a, an active budget document out a week before, just given the, the tightness, the tightness of this timeline, the way we would for a typical budget hearing. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that does raise the question if, um, do we do the do we plan for the hearing on the twelfth or the twenty sixth? Given um, we'll be seeing the the budget presentation on the twelfth. So I think the town of Amherst anyway is hoping to have all the budgets passed school committee on June first. So I think it depends on whether the committee is comfortable having hearing and voting the same night, or oh. planning a meeting on the twenty eighth or something like that. You know, which which is certainly could be done. This again, because you're not under the same sort of rules, I think, it, you know, you sort of can can do it both ways. Right, right. Mr. Demling? Does this raise the issue we were talking about before, though, which is how are we going to pass a regional school district budget? Which is typically, I, I imagine the, well, the Amherst Town Council, for example, wants to know how much Amherst is going to be paying. <laughs> so if we haven't talked about assessment methods and what the assessment to Amherst is, is there still that drive for June 1st to give them a, a top level budget that they can, what, make, make a guess at what Amherst's cut of that is gonna be? I... So we'll be proposing next time, both of those. I know we don't have to and the DESE guidance isn't, but we agree with all the consensus that I felt from this committee that, that going forward without letting the towns, at least giving them a sense of what to respond to is not gonna be practical. Um, I'm not saying we'll come to hunky dory agreement on it, but we'll we'll be coming with a suggestion both in terms of a dollar amount assessments and then budget cuts for our next meeting. Ms. Spitzer. I, I just have a question going back to the idea of doing a hearing is how is that gonna look? Um at the are we going to have like public comment in the way that we did earlier this evening? Or are we gonna be able to have an interactive situation? Is there any potential for that or? Um, I, I think that that's a point that we can discuss uh, this evening. Um, the I think that you know the going in um, default would be to to manage it in the way that we've been doing it, which is the email um, in and um, and sharing it on screen. Um, I know that there's been other uh, that the district has used, for example, with the um, 
the questions, the the um, the event that was held on Friday, the uh, wellness um, thing, there was another that was more of a discussion. Um, and you know, there's there's sort of benefits and drawbacks to each approach um, for that. So I don't know, um, Dr. Morris, if you have any thoughts on that. You have you've you've participated in many other types of meetings where there's been conversation or feedback. So um. right. So typically, the way budget hearings work is that people can come up and make comments in the same way that people are doing electronically here. And the difference between that and a typical meeting is that, uh, according to policy, public comments generally aren't responded to. And the distinction would be in a hearing, uh, more typically, there is the opportunity for both school committee and staff to respond. But it's, it's when you use the word interactive or two-way, I think that's the way that most budget hearings operate in that context, not a conversational piece. It's more that instead of reading public comment or listening to public comment, that there's a response or at least the opportunity to respond um, by committee members or staff. Um, so I think that can function in the current environment. We can think about what works, you know, different or better. Um, but that's the budget hearings that I've been to have, have the vast majority of them, I would say. Um, that's how they've been. The distinction is that there's the opportunity to respond by staff or committee members as opposed to listen and consider but not actively respond at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And, and I would, I, at least the, the in another district in the Amherst School Committee, the hearing um, uh, was more in that approach. So we received all of the, the input and questions, and then, um, then there was a response period, but not necessarily a conversation and individual response to individual questions. Ms. Spitzer? I guess I... Yeah, I understand that we won't be having like a, a back and forth. I think, um, I guess I would just like to say that um, I, I think it would be really nice to be able to hear people's voices during the public budget hearing, just because I think that there's a lot that's communicated through voice and reading. And, and I'm not sure how this is looking on Immerse Media. I haven't tuned in, but I'm just concerned also somewhat about accessibility issues. Like if I have site issues and we're just broadcasting and nobody's right. reading a comment, it, it may make it harder for them to see it. So I'm just thinking about twofold. One is the emotion that people might convey with their voice. And then secondly, the, the, the accessibility issue. And I think particularly with the budget, we wanna make sure we're um, capturing, um, capturing it as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can talk, you know, I'll work with the chair and we could figure out maybe a, a way to try to do that. Are, are there any other um, thoughts on this um, schedule, topics planning, budget hearing, any? I'm not seeing any. If anybody, um, and, and obviously if there's other thoughts, um, anybody from the committee, um, I know we have two new members, but if you have any other, um, you know, after after tonight and, and you're, you w wish that we had added XYZ agenda item to some future meeting, absolutely just email myself and Dr. Morris. Um, and we can we can talk about how we how we integrate that into the schedule. This is by no means like carved in stone. So, um, as as nothing is these days, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, great, and that not just to our two new members that holds true for oh, all of us on on the committee. So I just <laughs> um, the okay. So I think that we're through our new and continuing business, and we actually now have gifts to accept. Um, the, the paperwork for our gifts. There, there were two, in our packet there were two, but I believe one is for Amherst, is that correct? Yeah, the okay. updated packet and what I'm showing is just the regional gifts. Just the region, awesome, okay. Yeah. Would somebody like to make a motion?
Mr. Menino, would you like to make a motion? I can't read it. Okay. <laughs> it's so tiny on my screen. I'm trying to figure out how to make it. Okay. Okay. Um, move to accept the following gifts. Uh, Shirley Musabeki, number 238, Leo P. Vignault, Memorial Scholarship, $500. Vanguard Charitable, number 80337, James Quack and Sylvia Brandt, Distance Learning Technology, $5,000, EOS Foundation, number 287, COVID Rapid Response Nutritional Services, $2,500, ARPS PGO, number 212159, Distance Learning Internet Access gifts twenty thousand dollars for a grand total of twenty eight thousand dollars. And I can't read that line underneath it because it's blocked out. Oh, in compliance with state regulations regarding uh, the receipt of gifts, I suggest that the Pelham Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee officially accept these donations at its next week at this scheduled meeting. Thank you. Moved by Menino. Is there a second? I second. Lord. Seconded by Lord. And I, I know we talked about this this tremendous gift, um, uh, and there's there's several other ones as well now for um, to support some of the, these exp expenses. But we talked about the the PGOs raising um, significant sums of money in, in a very short period of time, and the outpouring of generosity from our community as well as some local organizations. And, um, and I did forward the list of um, sort of rec donor recognition of all the, the individuals and, and organizations behind that. So it's a, it's a tremendous gift. And um, thank you to the entire community to, who have supported providing internet access for all of our families and students. Any more? Ms. Spitzer. Um, Yes, I was, I'd like to echo the thanks and just um, the other day I made a donation and I got a call from a board member of that organization to say thank you. And I, I've been feeling like, especially in these times, not only for the people who have so generously donated, but also for the volunteers who are helping to run things like the food truck that are distributing meals that maybe if we could coordinate I, um, a little bit so but to send out personalized thank yous to some of these folks. Um, if anybody's interested in doing that, I, I don't know if that would go be, I don't know, would that be breaking open meeting law to coordinate sending thank you notes offline? But if, if not, um, I don't know, just, I, I feel like we, we should somehow formally thank folks. Dr. Slaughter. So one thing I will say to you is any gift that's received by the district, we do send a, a thank you letter from the district to, to that individual. So that is one piece of it. However, it was something like the, uh, the PGOs and the fundraising they did where the PGOs did it, it certainly, you know, they'll get a, a, a letter of, of thank you from us. If, if something more extensive were to be done, that would be um, probably appreciated, appreciated by the people that have, that have donated. And to Ms. Fitzer, I think as long as you don't have a quorum, which, I mean, maybe you'd have five people jumping in to help you with that. But I think, you know, if there's any, I mean, I don't think, it, you know, open meeting laws, you know, I don't think this would apply, but I'm not sure. But um, I think you keep that number at four and you're golden. Okay. I will volunteer for coordinating that. Great. Great, so we'll um, roll call vote, um, and hopefully I won't forget anybody this time. Um, uh, and I'm just gonna go by the order I see the images on my screen, so that way I won't forget. <laughs> so Ms. Stancer. You haven't made a motion yet. You, I believe you made a motion and Ms. Lord seconded, is that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we had a lot of discussion after the motion, so I, I, I <laughs> unusually met. So now everybody moved around. So I'm going to start with Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Spitzer. 
Spencer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Thank you, passes unanimously. And I believe that's our last item. Yes, so. Our motion. Ms. Spitzer. I move to adjourn. Moved by Spitzer. I second. Seconded by Ms. Stancer. And there's no discussion, so we'll do a roll call vote again. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>